invite you to join with me in this prayer as you close your eyes and just center yourselves on the Spirit because we know His love is extravagant and intimate and He's with us. So if you would just repeat after me this prayer and I'll give you line by line. Holy Spirit, speak through me. Holy Spirit, live through me. Holy Spirit, love through me. Holy Spirit, move through me. Amen. As you're being seated, we invite the children now to go with Bella and Ashley. They'll go down below for a, a message and a fun time together. We're excited about them being together today and thank Bella and Ashley for leading our children this morning. I'm so glad that you're here and, and want to thank Charity and, and, and Doug and Barry and Carl for leading us in worship this morning and for our wonderful tech team back here. We appreciate what they do for us, keeping our lights and our sound and our slides going. And they do a good job with their slides, don't they? They really do, so we appreciate that. And I want to thank everyone that comes here an hour or so earlier uh, to set up things out under the tent and get the chairs set up and get pins in the back of the chairs and pass out programs and all the things that go on behind the scenes um, to prepare us for worship. So I'm so encouraged by all those who want to serve and be a part of this community of faith. Is there anyone in here that doesn't appreciate a nice compliment from time to time? Do you like receiving compliments? I mean, most of us do, don't we? A compliment is truly oxygen for the soul. Let me tell you about a service on the web that's designed to lift you up when you're down. It's called emergencycompliment.com. Have you heard of it? Emergencycompliment.com. Well, you can look it up later on the day if you desire, if it really does exist. You can go there and see a brief message to feed your ego and boost your mood. Wouldn't you like to be told things like, your prom date still thinks about you all the time? <laughs> or you are someone's the one that got away. You'll find it there, emergencycompliment.com. The truth is, though, we all need a little pick-me-up from time to time. Well, how about this little verse that Valerie read for us just a few moments ago? It's, it's poignant. It's packed with a lot. Here we are with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's... Let's do it together. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works for which God prepared in advance for us to do. Very good. Think of that. We are God's handiwork. Or as one scholar has translated it, we are God's works of art. You're a work of art. How about that? A work of art. You're his handiwork. When Paul says that we are God's handiwork, he is not saying we're perfect. Anybody here think they're perfect? No, we're not perfect. He's not saying that. When Paul says that we are God's handiwork, he doesn't even claim that we are better than other people. In fact, he begins this passage describing in detail what rascals we've been. Yes, he writes, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. But then he writes, but because of his great love for us, his intimate love for us, his extravagant love for us, his great love for us, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Made us alive with Christ. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. We are God's handiwork because of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That's so important. I want you to hear this, ladies and gentlemen. I told you that these messages would mean something. They're transformational, that you would be able to apply them. It's not just coming to hear something that makes you feel good. And you leave out an hour later, you can't even remember what the scripture was, what the sermon title was, what the music was. No, when you come here, transformation will occur. You want to know why? Because the Holy Spirit's here. And the Holy Spirit's transformational. We don't rely on our flesh when we come to worship. We rely on Him. But we do offer ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to Him. Here I am, Lord. Use me, send me, fill me, equip me, speak through me. That's why I do that prayer every week. And hopefully it will become memorization, not here for you, but for here. Do you realize that today, when we say amen at the end, that our service will just be beginning? A lot of people say, oh, it's time to end the service oh, as we conclude the service now. No, we're just beginning. We're being equipped and we're being filled with his spirit. We're his handiwork. We're his creation. We're his children. And he's filling us up 
so that we can go out in a world that drains us empty. You know what I'm talking about. And have the power and the ability to transform other lives. It's not what we do, it's what he does within us. So this is important. What you become as a person is determined to a great extent by how you see yourself. How do you see yourself? Are there times where you just don't feel like you're good enough? I've said this many times and the spirit of Jim Carrey does enter the room every now and then. Sometimes don't you feel like I do? I am a lehu zaher. I feel like that sometimes. <laughs> that I'm not worthy, that I'm not any good, that I'm not valuable. Oh yeah, it seems like I've got it going on. You ever feel that way? But really inside, I'm struggling. I'm crying out. Things don't appear to be the way they seem. You know what I'm talking about. All of us have been there at one time or the other. You're probably there right now thinking, what's next? What do I need to do? Fully surrender to God. This morning, before you got here, our leadership team, including our worship team, we prayed. We prayed that when you stepped on this campus, when you drove into the parking lot, that you would experience the transformational power of God immediately, even before a word was spoken or a song was sung. That was our prayer, praying over you before you even got here, folks, because we care about you. We love you. You're part of the body of Christ, the body in motion. So what you become as a person is determined to a great extent of how you see yourself. Do you remember the motivational speech speaker Zig Ziglar? That's a lot to say, Zig Ziglar. He once said this, you cannot consistently perform in a manner which is inconsistent with the way you see yourself. We see that played out all the time in sports, don't we? Some of your baseball fans, last week I preached about baseball, okay? You'll remember a former championship manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers. His name is Tommy Lasorda. Yes. In an interview he did one time with baseball announcer Bob Costas. Lasorda confessed that one of his first outings as a relief pitcher, and he was a relief pitcher in the 1950s, he was so overcome by anxiety about pitching to certain players that he would deliberately try to balk so that the player could get walked. You know, when you kind of go through the motion to pitch and then you, you're not supposed to do that, or you go like this. My son knows how to do that because he's a pitcher. He would intentionally try to balk so he didn't have to pitch to these giant hitters that would come to the plate. He said that. He admitted that. Imagine that. A pitcher deliberately trying to be called for a balk. Problem was, the umpires wouldn't call it. Lasorda was forced to face his fears and overcome them. But he learned a whole lot from that experience. Fast forward now, several decades. Tommy Lasorda is now managing pitcher Oral Hershiser. Some of you might remember who he is. He was known as the Bulldog. Okay, it was his first year. And Tommy wanted to improve Hershiser's self-perception. Hershiser was this tall, lanky, skinny guy. He wasn't popular in the league, and nobody respected him. And the Dodgers were getting ready to play the Atlanta Braves. And Tommy told Oral, Tommy, when Dale Murphy, y'all remember Dale Murphy, comes up to bat and sees the name Oral, he's going to laugh, and he's going to pound you deep to the fence. So I'm going to give you a new name, Oral. Imagine being called Oral. Your name's going to be Bulldog. And that's actually going to be on the roster, Bulldog. And the rest, they say, is history. Oral Hershiser, or Bulldog Hershiser, as Lasorda called him, became a Hall of Fame pitcher. His most successful season came in 1988 when he set a major league record by pitching 59, Michael, listen to this, 59, he's a baseball player, 59 consecutive innings without allowing a run. He helped the Dodgers to a championship that year in the World Series and was named his division's most valuable player as well as the World Series MVP. That season, he also, listen to this, he also won the National League Cy Young Award as the best pitcher in baseball. What you become as a person is determined to a great extent to how you see yourself. Oral Hershiser saw himself as a scrawny, kid in Major League Baseball who didn't deserve to be there and he was scared and he was nervous but Tommy Lasorda gave him confidence gave him a new name guess who's given you a new name not Tommy Lasorda Jesus Christ he's called you by name and you are his he tells us in Isaiah 43 do not fear for I have redeemed you I have called you by name and you are what you're mine. And when I think of mine, I think of him embracing me like Jesus holding a sheep in his hands or his arms. That's what I think of. 
that intimate, extravagant love that he has for us. One of the 20th century's greatest preachers, Dr. Harry Emerson Fostick, once wrote this, hold a picture of yourself long enough and steady enough in your mind's eye and you'll be drawn toward it. Great living starts with a picture held in your imagination of what you would like to do or be. And that's good advice. Learning to accept yourself and believe in yourself is one of life's most important battles. Do you know that? Learning to accept yourself and believe in yourself is difficult. In 1971, Nancy Miller was a shy fifth grader in Atlanta, Georgia. She had a poor self-concept, a poor self-image. That poor self-concept came partially from the fact that she was born with only her pinky fingers and two partial fingers on both of her hands. She was too embarrassed to learn square dancing because she didn't think the boys would want to hold her hands. But through the encouragement of her PE teacher, who chose Nancy as his partner, she learned to accept herself and believe in herself. Today, Nancy Miller is a mother of four who plays the piano and types 65 words per minute, all because of a teacher who was there for her. May I say that learning to accept yourself and believe in yourself may be a particularly hard task for women? Yes. William Dorfman, he's a dentist to the stars in Los Angeles, California. My mother says California. <laughs> he also donates his skills to a local women's shelter where he fixes the teeth of homeless women, prostitutes, abused women, and children. One benefit of his work at the shelter is seeing these women develop a new sense of self-confidence once the work has been done on their teeth. As Dorfman says of his patients, she becomes a new person because she sees a new person. Now, why do I say that this may be a more difficult task in our society for women? Studies show that starting in about fourth grade, boys tend to overestimate their school performance compared to how their teachers rate them. Girls, on the other hand, tend to underestimate their performance. Why that is so, I don't know, but it is. Furthermore, boys tend to attribute their failures to bad luck or the difficulty of the task or not trying hard enough because they spend so much time playing Fortnite <laughs> or uh, binging on Netflix, whatever it is, or eating. We like to eat, don't we? Girls tend to attribute their failures to personal incompetence. This may be one reason why girls are more prone to depression. Now, I believe that. I'm a chaplain in the hospital. Matter of fact, my last day is this Tuesday. And I counsel men and women, and I counsel those in our behavioral center. And I can't tell you how many women, girls now, I'm talking about teenagers, preteens, young adults that come in with depression and sadness. And a lot of these girls look like they've got it going on. They do. They're beautiful. They're articulate. And yet, they're depressed. They're sad. Their self-worth is zero. It's a difficult place to be. And to counsel them and to equip them in the little hour that I have with them is one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do. But thanks be to God, he's began to give me the tools and the words and I can bring biblical principles into the hospital without even quoting scripture, but I'm doing it. And they don't even know it, but they do. Because the comment is, I spent all this money on professional counseling, but what I learned today and what you said today, it moved me. It made a difference. And they've used the word, it transformed me. You want to know why? Because biblical principles, principles based on the Bible, they're transformational. Anything else that we learn, it might can bring about some change, but it's temporary. You see, God's word is eternal. It's everlasting, ladies and gentlemen. It stands on its own. I don't even have to add anything to it. If I just stood up here and read scripture to you today, that's all we would really need to do. But thanks be to God that he's inspired me and that he's filled me with his spirit in a way where I can take his word and I can throw some baseball in there and some funny stories, but it's relevant and it moves you and it transforms you and now you've realized I can go to church and be open to raise my hands. I can go to church and talk about the Holy Spirit and live by the Holy Spirit and be about the Holy Spirit and I don't have to be weird to do that. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? You know exactly what I'm talking about. 
There's freedom in Christ. And if the Son has set you free, what? Can I get a what? You've been set free. You're free indeed. My goodness, why do we have to be like this? Hello, I'm a Christian. <laughs> I mean, come on, give me a break. Let's be free. Let's give the filet and, and french fries and the icy Coke and the, and, the, and the McFlurry with our Big Mac if we want it. You know, let's put a smile on our face. Let's be excited. It's tough though, isn't it? And especially tough for women. Really is. Researchers note that believing you are competent can be highly motiva motivating even when it's not true. Conversely, believing that you are incompetent can undermine your motivation even when it's not true. As a person thinks in his heart, so he is, is he. That's what Proverbs 23, 7 says. As a person thinks in their heart, so they are. Now, I believe we're doing a little better job as a society in helping women value themselves, but we still have a ways to go. Do you know how many young girls and women are being taken advantage of, the, taken advantage of today because of social networking? You want to know why? Because of this. Posting. You know what happens when that, you do that? It's cyberspace. I used to teach cyber safety, and that was a long time ago. It's still the same thing. It's forever out there. And so young ladies are targets nowadays. Targets and still abused. And there are some in this room that are. There are. And you'll never know it because they won't tell you. And certainly we know that there are many men who have a difficult time accepting themselves. As you know, one of the mysteries in our society right now is the increase in suicides among middle-aged men. Middle-aged men in the 45 to 60 age group experienced a 43% increase in suicide deaths from 1997 to 2014, and the rise has been even sharper since 2005. Do you know there was one year that I did the funerals of three men from 38 to 45 that committed suicide in one year, three, in a very isolated area. Hmm. It makes you go, hmm, doesn't it? What does that say about our society? What challenges do these men face that make them decide that taking their own life is the only way out? Again, when I'm counseling men, these men that have families and amazing jobs and huge salaries, they come in depressed and sad and their value and their worth is nothing. And then many of them are such in financial despair they can't make it. Seems like it's going great, but it's really not. They're constantly worrying. Some of you are that way. Some of you in here, when you lay your head down at night, you can't sleep because your mind is racing about all you've got to do. And that's a lot of men in here. That's a lot of men out there, ladies and gentlemen. There are women that face that too. I know that. The problem is that our self-image is determined at a very early age and is very difficult to undo. Years ago, Parade Magazine featured an interview with comedian Steve Allen. You remember Steve Allen? And his wife, Jane Meadows. On their marriage years together, this was the interview. They were interviewing about their marriage. And much of the article focused on Steve's unstable and dysfunctional family background. I don't know if you knew that or not. In a final comment about his childhood, Jane said, we are who we are because of where we've been. We are who we are because of where we've been. And that's true. We are who we are because of where we've been. Psychologists tell us that by the time we reach two years of age, this too, 50% of what we ever believe about ourselves has been formed. Wow. The bitters have a little one. Not even two yet. So 50% already. Think about that. Think about that, parents. Think of the importance of those first two years of life. By the age of six, six years old now, 60% of our self-belief has been established. And by eight, about 80%. By the time we reach the age 14, over 99% of us have a well-developed sense, either correctly or incorrectly, of who we are. So, Stephen, are y'all gonna have a children's ministry and a youth ministry at Mystery Creek? Yes! Of course we are. Do you know who you're talking to? I mean, come on. They say if you build it, they will come? Yes. And we're going to have a dynamic children's ministry and youth ministry. It might start out with one or two, but those one or two, boy, they're going to go around saying, my gosh, you ought to come to our youth group. You ought to come to Creek Kids. Woo! Man, we got it going on. Yes. You know why we got it going on? Because they're going to come because they seek the truth and we're going to deliver the truth. That's what they want. It ain't going to be all about, you know, the singing and dance. You don't want to see that anyway. It's going to be about him. And that's what they want. That's what they desire. 
the truth. That's what millennials want. In essence, that's what brings us all together, the truth. How about that? Isn't that something? It is something. It really is. It's never too late to change your self-image. It's never too late. Oh, Stephen, I'm 75, or I'm 62, or I'm 48. I, you know, I am who I am. This is me the rest of my life. No, you can change that. You can change it. I hadn't spoken to so-and-so in 30 years. We're on the outs. You can do something about that. It doesn't have to be that way. Does it? I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, Stephen, you don't know me that well. I'm not worth anything, and it's too late for me to change. One man said to his pastor, you know how at big basketball games, when their team is ahead, the home fans sometimes taunt the other team by cruelly chanting, overrated, overrated. I got to tell you, though, Josh, Auburn's basketball team was pretty darn good this year. They really were. Carrie, they were amazing. So nobody was chanting overrated at them. But you hear that at ball games. Deep in my heart, I hear that same taunt. Overrated, overrated. There's no hope for me. Oh, but there is hope. Remember Harry Emerson Fostick's great statement? Hold a picture of yourself long and steadily enough in your mind's eye, and you'll be, a, you'll be drawn toward it. Great living starts with a picture held in your imagination of what you would like to do or be. And so, congregation, we're going to do something now. I'll tell you, things are going to be different here. We're going to do something now that's going to transform you. Aren't you glad you came to church today? You're going to go back and you're going to tell everybody about today. You're going to say, my gosh, you won't believe what happened over at Mystic Creek today. It's the truth. You will. I guarantee you. So what I want you to do now, if you would, would you close your eyes? We're going to have a meditation. This meditation is going to be a little different than what you're used to. And as we prepare for this meditation, something that I do that helps me sleep at night, you probably want to take notes about this. No, you don't have to take any notes. Is I take deep breaths. And when I do that deep breath, I take that deep breath in from my gut. So I draw it in from my gut and then I breathe it out. So I draw it in through my nose and then I breathe it out through my mouth. So I want you to prepare to do that. And on the count of three, I want you to do that. I want you to, you, to breathe in from your gut through your nose and then breathe out through your mouth. When you're ready to do that on the count of three. One, two, three. Let's do that again on the count of three. One, two, three. And one more time on the count of three. Really do it. One, two, three. May I suggest you add another picture to those already in your mind? I know your eyes are closed and you're picturing all sorts of things and you're thinking about what you gotta do, what your responsibilities are this next week, school starting back up, work starting back up, what you're gonna have for lunch today, getting things in order for family that are coming in, squeezing in that last vacation, will we be able to do that? The mortgage payment's coming due soon, college tuition's coming soon, that's all in your mind, you're, you're just consumed. But right now I want you to just You've just released a lot, but I want you to take another deep breath in and out, and I want you to release all that into the Lord's hands. Whatever it is, list it in your mind, in your heart, all the things, if it's school, if it's anxiety, if it's friends, if it's a relationship, whatever it is, and I want you to release that. When you release it and you, let, you, you breathe it in and you breathe it out, that means you're giving it to God. Take a few moments just to think about those things, and then on the count of three, we'll do that breath, and we'll release it to God. One, two, three. Here's the picture I want you to place in your mind. It is a picture of Christ with a lamb in his arms. That lamb is you. Now picture Christ with his arms wide open with a smile on his face. He wants to take you in his arms and let you know how special you are to him. 
This works best if you can close your eyes. He's, he's at the door of your heart and he's knocking. Picture him knocking at the door of your heart. And he wants to come in and make you a new creation. It's not too late by the grace of God to change the way you think about yourself. He says, I love you. I created you, I molded you, I shaped you, I breathed into you the breath of life. I know you intricately. And I love you extravagantly. You're made in the image of God. In my image, he says. You're very valuable. For me, the meaning of life is to share with people the wonderful news that we are daughters and sons of God. And as we continue this meditation, I'm reminded of St. Paul's words. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Can you imagine that he is saying that about your life? He created you to do good works? that you're his masterpiece. It makes no difference who you are. It makes no difference what you've done. It doesn't matter how many strikes are against you. You're his work of art. With his help, you can turn your mess into a masterpiece. Learning to accept yourself and believe in yourself is one of life's most important battles. The problem is that our self-image is determined at a very early age and it's very difficult to undo. However, it's never too late to change and to be transformed by his power. Your life begins, it begins when you understand that you are God's handiwork and maybe for you, you come to the epiphany today that your life has just begun. And now you know who you're living for and what your purpose is. You're his work of art and he has a plan for your life. When you realize that and you surrender to him, you'll be on the path to being all he intends for you to be. Do you want to experience human wholeness? That's the freedom to give and receive love from God and from others. You know, I not only love Jesus, I like him. He's my best friend. He wants to be your best friend. He wants you and he needs you to love him. Is that not awe-inspiring to you that the mighty God of all creation El Shaddai, Elohim, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jaffra, the great I am, I am, desires you and wants you to love him and receive his son Christ, that that's your purpose, he has a plan for you, you're his masterpiece. And his son Jesus, the great shepherd, you're his sheep. And do you want to know something? It started way before this, but it really started in the living room of a sweet family, the Menifees, where he began to place a call on my life, on Doug's life, and on your life, many of you. And he's called me by name. He's equipped me and empowered me to be your shepherd. And this is humbling to say it, but it's, it's true. Because of him, you're my sheep. And I will lay down my life for every one of you in this room. No matter if you're in Italy, you're in Varnell, Peachtree City, Roswell, Norcross, it doesn't matter. 
because we are one in Christ. One Lord, one baptism, one faith. And when you begin to realize that, you have brothers and sisters that care about you, that love you, that are there for you, you'll never be the same. And so let's take care of each other. Let's be there for one another. Let's provide the emotional support that we, that we need so much. Don't hold it in. Let it out. Tell others about what you're going through. You cannot do life alone. It's impossible. It's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. There's no one or nothing that can defeat you. So today, we're going to rebuke anything and everything that's paralyzing you. In the name of Jesus Christ, and you can say this with me, in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke bad health. In the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke sorrow and sadness. In the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke anxiety in the name of Jesus Christ I rebuke frustration and fear and lust and depression in the name of Jesus Christ I rebuke the evil one and the power of sin because the power of sin is no more. Jesus Christ has defeated sin. Jesus Christ has defeated anxiety. Jesus Christ has defeated frustration and separation and inadequacy and I'm not good enough and I'm a loser. I'm nothing. He's defeated that because you are more than a conqueror for those who are in Christ Jesus and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ no matter what you've done, no matter what you've said, He loves you and He forgives you. You are a child of God. You are a son of the King. And right now, He is holding you in the palm of His hands, in His arms. You are His sheep. Thanks be to God. As you open your eyes, and you see this image that is you. That is you. That's Jesus holding you in his arms. That's Jesus holding that child you lost, that father that husband, that mother, that cousin, that sister, that brother, that best friend, that grandparent, that Mimi, that great grandmama, that great granddaddy. <sighs> He's holding them too, isn't he? He's holding you. So if you haven't made him Lord of your life today, will you do it right now? Will you? Will you just say, Jesus, I love you. I want to follow you. I want to serve you all the days of my life. I don't exactly know what that looks like. I'm kind of confused in many ways. But God is not a God of confusion, is he? Is he? No. What he wants you to do now, that you've received him as your Savior, is to get involved in a Bible-believing, truth-believing church. And if Mystery Creek is that church, thanks be to God. There's no pressure here. There's no hard sell here at all. But you're welcome here in this place. And yes, this, the selfish side of me wants to see every seat filled in this place. Do you know how many unchurched people are in a three-mile radius of this place? Mission Insight, look it up. You can find out. Put in the zip code. Thousands. If you go in a 25-mile radius, it's a million. So we've got some work to do, don't we? We really do. I want to thank Sally for this beautiful work of art. This is a gift to our church from her, and she is a gift, and so is her son, Coulter, and I'm thankful for her other son, Walker, and her husband, who is an amazing cook on the grill, by the way. But you see, that's the intimate love of the Father. As your pastor, 
I want to know every one of you intimately by name. I want to know what you're going through and what your struggles are. But you know, it's not just me. The core group of this congregation, we made a, a pact with the Lord, we, a prayer that we would be intentional and involved in each other's lives. That means we're their body of Christ. And we're going to be extensions of Christ to reach you and reach this community. We're going to offer community groups, which are small groups. We're going to have ministries for, for children and youth. But we're going to stay simple. And you say, well, what does that mean, Stephen? We're not going to offer hundreds and hundreds of programs to just offer them. We're not just going to just be a church that's attractive for Christians. I mean, a lot of people are doing that. Let's, let's build it to make it attractive for believers. We're going to be a church that pulls in and attracts. And I hate to use that word, but it's true. All persons. We're going to offer, as Carl Rogers, the great psychotherapist, said, unconditional positive regards to all persons, no matter who they are, no matter where they come from, when they walk in that door. They're going to, they're going to experience this right here. Right here. And they're going to hear music that comes from above. And they're going to see the reflection of Christ on the faces of people like this. People like this. I know I'm going long today, but that's the beauty of this because I haven't seen anybody doing this. I haven't even seen anybody doing this. You know? Because we're operating on God's time. And God's timing is exactly different from ours, isn't it? Right? So we're not worrying about, will we beat the Baptist to eat today? <laughs> we're not worrying about that anymore. You know, hopefully we'll get there when they get there so we can interact with them. Because guess what? This church is next door to us. God placed them in our lives. We wouldn't be in this building if God hadn't used them to open the doors. And they said, it's yours. They even told us their campus is ours. Anything you want, anything you need. They even show up at the end of our services with one of their deacons or elders. Is there anything we can do for you? Is there anything we can help you with? Can you believe that? Is the air working for you? The bathroom's okay? That sort of thing. God, that's God, right? So just remember that today. And remember that our service does not end. It's just beginning. So let's stand together and let's celebrate what God is doing as we begin our service together.